There you go. Okay. All right. So since we're recording, yeah. So if you want to watch who's coming in um, on the participants tab, you can see the attendees. Great. Got it. So if you want to monitor for a critical number, we're at, uh, we're at 10. Hi, hey, everybody. Hi. Well, the, the introduction is the least important part. Your guys is the most important part. So I'm just going to get started. So on behalf of Center for Cultural Innovation, I'm Allison Wiper, the Artist Knowledge Manager at CCI. I want to welcome you guys all to um, our webinar. I'm very excited to have Jill James and Claire Van Hollen. Claire's uh, trained with us in Los Angeles several times in the past year. And so we're excited to have her back and to have Jill for the first time. Um, so uh, I'm going to give them as much time as possible to totally maximize the, their training time and Q&A time, but I just want to let you guys know, check out cciarts.org. I just launched this morning um, a registration page for an April 21st workshop on negotiating the unexpected with two art lawyers who are going to talk about um, how to deal with contracts and obligations that you may have, how to maintain relationships when those contracts are changing, and um, all sorts of good tips. So check that out. It's going to be sliding scale. I'll pay what you can. Um, we also have on April 28th a financial planning workshop, which you can also check out specifically for artists and creatives. And um, I just wanted to let you guys know, and I'll probably remind you at the end, I'm going to email everyone who registered um, after this workshop with a link to a workshop evaluation so you guys can give us feedback. And that will be shared with Jill and Claire, um, and the, as well as um, CCI staff. So take it away. All right, I'm gonna spotlight here. So hi, I'm Jill James. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of SIF Industries. Um, and uh, thank you all for signing up today. I know this is a particularly stressful time and you know, Claire and I have been going through all of these programs and you know, I think our, our feedback on it is like, if we're challenged to go through it, we don't know how other people are doing it. So. We want to try to break this down <clears throat> as simply as we can so for some of the options that you have in terms of getting funding for your business right now, getting small business relief for you as an individual or as a business, um, and, and just kind of walking you through some of those choices and how to do it um, so that you have a clearer sense of, of what your options are. Um, and Claire, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Um, so um, as Allison said, I have taught a handful of workshops with CCI, uh, especially within the last year on just managing financials for artists. And I run the CV Ledger, which is um, a boutique accountancy working primarily with creatives around day to day accounting and just setting up the day to day business operations. And I also work closely with Jill on a number of other projects. Thank you. I'm going to jump back onto mine. Um, so for, sorry, are you still able to hear us? I just saw someone type, we've gone mute. That looks like my video or my audio is sending. Um, so just I'm hearing everything house, just fine. Okay, great. A couple of housekeeping things before we get into this. Um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions as we go, please feel welcome to type them in there and you'll be able to see questions other people have sent. Um, what we've found with doing several of these is questions get lost in the chat. Um, so if you can put your questions into Q&A, um, either Claire will be able to answer them as we go within the Q&A window or she'll highlight them to me. Um, and when we get to the end, I'll be doing, uh, Claire and I will be doing about 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A or as much as we have time for if we have more time than that. Um, but that's the easiest way to make sure that we see your question um, and that if it's something that we can clarify in the moment, we'll jump in and do that for the group. If it's a specific question about something that you have a question about, then um, Claire can just write it back to you in the Q&A window. All right, uh, I'm going to jump in and share screen. We have a presentation for you. Um, and uh, let's open that up. Okay. 
Can you all seeing screen? Looks good. Looks good. Okay, great. Um, so our focus today is on giving you three ways you can protect your arts business right now. Um, so uh, a little bit more here about CV Ledger, which is Claire's company. Um, she works with small businesses and creative entrepreneurs around operations systems, accountability, um, budgeting, payroll. Um, and she is launching the Naked Finance video series uh, in the next couple of months. So if you're interested in getting that, uh, sign up at her website on cvledger.com and follow her on Instagram. Claire, anything you want to add to my quick rundown of your slide? No. Okay. Nice and easy, quick, high level, <laughs> good. <laughs> I, I'm available to pitch your business at any time. I've been working with Claire. I've been working with Claire for about two and a half years. Um, and she does all of my bookkeeping and um, all of my strategic accounting. And I have to tell you, I have a flawless tax process. I spent 30, I spent 30 minutes with my tax accountant and he just looks at the reports and says, well, this is incredible. You can go home now. <laughs> so, um, so I highly recommend her services. Um, and then uh, my company, uh, SIF Industries, I specialize in working with self-funded small business owners, uh, in particular female-founded companies, but um, I do uh, you know, work with everyone, but I have a few programs that are specifically for female founders. Um, and what I focus on is um, working with folks who come from creative and non-managerial backgrounds who are running a business for the first time. Uh, and filling in some of the gaps that you may have in um, your understanding of operations, finance, and some of the strategic options available to you to help you grow your company to the size where you feel confident as a CEO um, and that you're running at a sustainable level where you're paying yourself what you want to um, and that you, um, you feel like you're the CEO of the business versus the business running you. Um, so there are a few resources here. Um, I've been sending out regular newsletter updates um, at least twice a week. Um, normally we're just weekly, but um, as much as I have updates on the programs that are going on, <clears throat> new small business opportunities, and you know, some of the clarifications that we're getting, um, I've been sending those out in my newsletter. So if you'd like to get, uh, get those, there's uh, a link right here, bit.ly uh, bit, bit slash this newsletter, um, which you can sign up for. And we should have these slides available when we post the video of this um, this workshop, or I can email it around also to everybody who's registered okay. after yeah. the fact. Yeah. And as much as possible, other than on Claire's and my slides, um, I tried to put the full year URL on the screen for you in addition to linking it for when you get the slides. So if you want to take screenshots of this, that's totally fine. Um, I, one of the, the reasons that we're doing this, I think this is my fourth webinar in a week and a half. Uh, and <laughs> I think Claire, you've done a few as well. Um, we just wanna help as many self-funded small business owners as possible realize their options for their business right now. So you know, if you can share this with another person who you know wants this information, um, we're not, you know, this isn't proprietary to us. We put this together to reach as many people as possible. So please feel welcome to share this with your, your fellow artists, your fellow business owners, um, if you think it would be helpful to them. Um, and last thing before we get into it, um, Claire and I are not your, your particular accounting or legal professionals. Uh, so as you, as you think through this, if you have any specific questions about your business, you know, we'll try to help you in general with the program, but the best people to work with are those who already intimately know your business and your numbers. Um, so please feel welcome to get back up from your own accountant or lawyer um, if you need that uh, as we go forward. All right, so our first type of protection, which you've probably read a lot about in the last 10 days, uh, are two small business relief programs, the Paycheck Protection Program and the Emergency Disaster Loan Program. Um, so I'm going to go through both of these in detail, um, and we'll give you some sense of how they work together. But the, um, the first and most important part to know is that um, the CARES Act, which passed a week ago Friday, has opened up a whole bunch of programs from the SBA that used to only be for companies under 50 people for profit um, and to, to formally uh, incorporated businesses. They've kind of blown open who can access these programs. 
So in both programs that I'm talking about, the EDIL and the PPP, um, the, if you are self-employed, if you are an independent contractor, if you are a freelancer, if you own income property, if you have a side hustle, um, if you're running a business as a sole proprietor, but you don't have a separate business bank account and you don't have a separate business name, um, you can access all of these programs, uh, the PPP starting tomorrow and the EDIL right now. Um, also, if you're a single member LLC, a single member S Corp, you don't have an employee except for yourself, a C Corp, um, all of those are eligible for these programs. Um, and in addition to that, um, they've opened it up for not-for-profits as well. So if you're formally incorporated as a 501c3, you can access these SBA programs that used to not be possible, tribal organizations, veterans organizations. Um, this is open to everyone organized this way. So lots of new options, even though it's through the SBA. Um, this used to be for companies with fewer than 50 employees. They've raised it to fewer than 500 employees. You still have to meet the definition of a small business, which is typically based on your revenue. But if you're under $10 million a year, you should definitely be okay. If you're above that, you can look at the NAICS small business standards for your industry and figure out um, if you still qualify as a small business. Um, the one um, exemption from that is if you are in restaurant or hospitality, um, they are taking some of the small business standards off of that and also allowing you up to 500 employees per location. Um, so this is catering to companies that have franchise or uh, a larger number of employees like at a hotel or boutique hotel or something like that. All right. Um, so people who are not eligible today for these programs, um, Companies or individuals who went into business after February 1st of this year, uh, you had to have, um, you had to be in business by February 1st. Um, also companies that are backed by venture capital portfolios. If you have an individual who has invested in you, that's okay. But if you have VC backing or a professional investor behind you who has a large number of companies where they own a lot, um, that is typically a problem when you apply for the program under something called the affiliation rule. So if you are not sure about this and you have investors, um, you will have to talk to them and get information from them anyway in the course of applying. Uh, so you can clarify this with them um, by asking if they uh, have run into any issues with the affiliation rule uh, with their other companies. Um, but it is okay to have, you know, if there are several of you that have invested together in a business, um, you have to disclose any person who owns more than 20% of the company. You have to uh, disclose what percentage they own and provide their social security number and address uh, in order to validate their stake. Um, but again, um, if you're you know, three people who have gone in together and you each own a third of the company, that's going to be totally okay. Um, so the first program that we'll talk about is called the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP. Um, this is a new type of loan program that didn't exist before 10 days ago. Um, it is a short-term forgivable loan program that's being run through banks, commercial lenders, um, between now and June 30th. Um, and when we say forgivable, um, if you use it for certain types of qualified expenses, that means you don't have to pay the loan back, right? So. Um, I have had folks that I've talked to say, tune out when I say loan, but just because this is structured as a loan doesn't mean that it's gonna behave like a loan in the future, right? There is a way to get 100% of this money forgiven eight weeks from now so that you effectively get this money with, with no obligations to pay any other interest or make any other payment. Um, so your eligibility for this is based on what you've paid in payroll or what you've paid to yourself over the last 12 months, um, including group benefits. So unfortunately, if it's just you paying your health insurance, that's not gonna count. But if you're part of a group benefit program, you get to count the cost of the benefit. Your state payroll tax, monies you've paid for time off, um, that all counts. Uh, so you add up what you've, what you've um, spent on that over the last 12 months or if you're a newer business or you have seasonal employees or you're self-employed and you just have expenses and income, there are different um, 
there are different formulas for that, and we'll get to that in a little bit. We'll give you some links for that. Um, but in general, you're going to be asked of uh, what did you pay in these categories over the last 12 months. You'll take the total, you'll divide it by 12, and then you multiply it by 2.5. That's the total amount of the loan that you can get. Um, and that loan is 100% forgivable if you use the money for payroll, benefits, rent, or utilities over the first eight weeks that you have the loan. So from the minute it hits, the money hits your account until eight weeks later, um, if you use it for these purposes and you can document that, uh, the loan will be 100% forgiven. But if you decide to reduce your staff or cut their salaries, um, it can reduce the forgivability of the loan. Um, so you have to, you can furlough people, you can lay people off, but you have to hire them back during this period of the loan. Um, the balance of funds, if there's anything else, rolls into a two-year loan at 1% interest. You would start paying that six months from now. Or if there's excess money that you haven't used, you can give it back to pay off the loan and not incur any additional interest. Um, so the best worksheet that we've seen for this is this Chamber of Commerce worksheet because it walks you through um, if you are the standard 12-month calculation, what to put in and what not to put in and how to calculate it. If you're seasonal or self-employed or you're a new business, it gives you exactly what numbers you need in order to calculate your eligibility. So if you want to apply for the PPP, um, unless you're with Wells Fargo, I'll give you that exception in a second, um, most other banks have an application available right now, an application process. Um, and the uh, Treasury Department has encouraged all of us to work with our own bank first. So if you have an existing business bank account or starting tomorrow, regular bank account with like Bank of America or Chase or Union Bank or, you know, really um, pretty much any bank that like I could come up with a name for, um, they probably are already an SBA lender and they have a program for this. Um, if you are self-employed or an independent contractor, you can start applying for this tomorrow, but right now it isn't open. Um, so only businesses that are incorporated or sole proprietors who have a separate business bank account and credit card can apply right now. But starting tomorrow, everyone who's self-employed or an independent contractor can start applying. They'll open that up. Um, and I did just see before we got on here that um, if you use QuickBooks Payroll, which I know is pretty popular with small businesses, on Sunday, they're going to start facilitating um, direct applications through Intuit. Um, so it may be worth um, waiting. Um, if your bank seems a little muddled or it's not clear on what you're supposed to do, um, you might want to wait till Sunday and, and just see what QuickBooks makes uh, available to you through your QuickBooks account. Um, so ch again, check with your bank first. Um, it's been a little difficult. There are you know, hundreds of other SBA lenders, but a lot of them are not taking on um, clients that don't already work with them. Um, so if you do have that problem, unfortunately, anyone who works with Wells Fargo because of some problems they had last year, they've been capped out of the program. Um, so if you work with Wells Fargo, we have to find you a different lender. Um, but any other major bank, you should still be able to apply through them. Um, your qualifying is based only on your credit score. Um, unfortunately, if you've had a bankruptcy in the last seven years, you're not going to qualify for this. Um, but uh, generally, credit score has been pretty loose, but we don't know exactly where that number is yet. Um, but it will be based on your business credit score or your personal credit score. Um, an item you'll need to organize are your 2019 payroll records, what you paid everyone and who was on your payroll. Um, your uh, W-4 2019 employees, people who, again, were on your payroll during the calendar year of 2019 for some of or all of it. Um, and anyone who was compensated over $100,000 a year in salary, you cap what you count at $100,000 for them. Um, your healthcare costs, if you had uh, healthcare, uh, group healthcare premiums, you can add that in. Um, and if you had a company retirement program, you can add in the cost or, or the matching that you spent on that program. All of that in the box that says payroll, all of those numbers together are what count as your payroll. 
And these are a few of the specific documents that you can look at. This is a good one to screenshot. Um, when you get into your bank, they'll have a list like this too. Um, but these are some of the documents that might be in your payroll system or in your accounting system um, that, or maybe you've gotten you know, a draft of your 2019 taxes if you haven't filed them yet. Um, all of these will help you in filing for the PPP. So Claire, anything to jump in on, on the PPP before we go on uh, to the next loan type? No, I mean, it's really the, um, so just know that depending on who your lender or bank is, that the application process is going to be different from the next. So while a lot of these questions will be relatively the same, um, you can definitely expect some variances. And if you are in conversations with colleagues, um, of yours about this, you know, again, depending on who their banker or lender are, then um, they might get a slightly varied set of questions as part of the application process. So just something to keep of note. Um, so if you do know anyone who is applying or wants to apply for the PPP and also has the same lender and you want to get feedback on just what that process was like, I would encourage you to first ask who their lender is before you get any outside opinions. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, yes, every bank is different in their process. Um, we have seen people apply and say they get funded. We have seen at other banks that it's taking you know, two to five days. Um, it, it's a widely varied process because uh, the SBA and the Treasury Department keep redefining things. Um, so, I would just assume no matter what the program says, is you need to allow seven to 10 days to get these funds, right? So if you have payroll coming up and you think, oh, I'll apply today and I'll have this for payroll on Monday, maybe, but I wouldn't count on it. Um, so this is, uh, you know, it's from whatever, the eight weeks are from whatever day the money hits your account and you're approved. Um, so again, you won't be penalized. Um, for you know, the eight weeks forward for your employees. So that's the first type of loan. Again, that's the forgivable loan, the, the PPP program. Um, the other type of loan program is the Economic Disaster Impact Loan or EDIL program. This is a pre-existing program that's run by the Small Business Association, SBA.gov. Um, this is something that if you had a tornado or a flood or a fire, you know, in your, in your area, you would have been able to apply for at any time. Um, so there's a specific $300 billion fund um, that's been added specifically for uh, economic disaster and injury. Um, it's now, uh, that's available in every state. Every state has been declared a disaster zone for purposes of, of FEMA and for the SBA. Um, so every, anyone in any state can apply for this. Um, it's a 30-year loan. If you're a for-profit, it's a 3.75 interest rate. If you're not for profit, uh, it's 2.75. You start with a six-month deferral on your first payment. And this program is available for the rest of the year, right? So we're all in the zone to apply for this from right now, or if you applied for an SBA loan earlier in the year, you can roll it into this program all the way through December 31st. Um, a couple of notes, if you've ever looked at an SBA loan before, there used to be a personal guarantee and a collateral obligation um, for any amount of loan. If your loan is under $200,000, that's been waived. So there's no personal guarantee and no collateral requirement for loans under $200,000. Um, and as of last Monday, um, if you've gone through this process, it used to be an 80-page application form, was very complicated and had an asset balance sheet on it. That's all been taken out. Um, so at this URL, uh, covid19relief.sba.gov, there is a simplified form that's five pages um, and distills what type of business you are, how you're organized, again, not-for-profit, um, you can be a, a, a property owner with rental property and apply for this. Um, all of those categories that I went through earlier, um, those are all eligible under the EDIL program because it's based on either uh, economic injury that you've had due to, uh, the, due to the coronavirus already or that you anticipate having for the rest of the year. 
Um, so the simplified information that you'll need, um, you need your company information, including your EIN, or if you run on your social security number, your social security number. Um, you have to, again, provide any owners and stakes over 20%. Um, along with their social security numbers or EIN, um, and gross revenue and your, your cost of goods um, from February of this year until, or February of last year to January of this year. Um, and if you're a not-for-profit, there's also a line item for your operating expenses. But again, radically simplified from anything that you've needed to provide in the past. Um, and the other new piece of this is um, there is an optional advance which when you go through the form on the last page, it asks if you want to opt in and you put your bank account number in. Um, there's an optional advance of up to $10,000 that you can receive in theory within three days, but we don't know anyone, and we don't know anyone who's gotten it yet. So the program says three days, but this is an unknown. Um, but the $10,000 advance is yours, uh, even if you're later denied the loan. You don't have to repay it, and there's no qualification on how you can use it. So you can pay vendors, you can pay 1099s, you you know you can pay use it to pay yourself if it isn't in conflict with the money you get from the PPP. Um, it's basically a flexible amount of, of a grant um, against your future application that you can spend on what you what you need to cover. Um, if you did that super long application for the SBA before this. Um, and you want to apply for the advance, um, you can go through and reapply and click the advance box and the SBA will match up your application with what you did before with this um, and basically streamline it so that uh, they take all that work that you did before and roll it into the new process. Um, we've heard there's a forgivable element to this, but we don't know what it is yet. Um, it feels like EDIL has kind of gone on the back burner because uh, it's been so much effort to get the PPP into market. Um, but there is supposed to be a forgivable element through the CARES Act. We just don't know what it is yet. So other things that we don't know yet. Um, in general, with the PPP, we'd encourage you to apply as soon as you're ready. Again, that $350 billion as of yesterday, uh, a bit over $100 billion was already claimed. Um, so there isn't indefinite funding here. So apply as soon as you're ready. Um, you know, we know that Congress is talking about another round of relief. It seems likely, but again, not guaranteed until they sign, sign it into law. Um, for the EDIL, uh, the SBA said the taking away the collateral agreement will speed up the approvals. Um, typically, it's four to six weeks. They're saying two to three weeks, but again, we don't have evidence that that's happening yet. Um, so it's just kind of a work in progress to figure out. I've been telling my clients not to count on EDIL money before the second half of May. Um, if it comes earlier, great, but I, I think that's realistically as soon as we're gonna see it. Um, and then, you know, we don't know again if there's a, um, what or how the forgivable portion of this new uh, SBA allowance will work. Um, for the PPP, we don't know what a good credit score is. I have yet to see someone who is denied. Um, based on credit score. But uh, again, there's no standard definition where there's a hard number of a minimum level of credit score. Um, in terms of availability, businesses or sole proprietors with separate bank accounts can apply now, that's open. Um, if you use your own bank account, you're an independent contractor, you're a freelancer, it starts tomorrow. Um, timeline, uh, this is supposed to be pretty instantaneous, but um, we're advising seven to 10 days allowance for underwriting. Uh, Claire, anything from questions or anything else to clarify on EDL and PPP? Uh, no, I mean, the only thing I would say for EIL is that that application, for those of you who haven't already tried to apply for it, is is relatively straightforward. And again, as Jill said, it's, it is directly through the SBA, assuming that you have your numbers ready from 2019 in terms of what your gross profit are, as well as your cost of goods sold from 2019, then the application in total should take no more than 10 minutes. Um, but that's again, assuming that you have your numbers in order. Uh, PPP, again, it's just really just contingent on your lender and your bank um, and what kind of process they've set that up. So that will just keep in mind vary from bank to bank. But yeah, that's, that's really the only additional I have to add. 
Okay. I notice there's one question in the Q&A, Claire. Yeah, so could you clarify the 10K advance that could be a grant in EDIL? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so it's it's literally just a checkbox as you were going through the process and it sounds crazy, but it's as simple as that. And, and I think what it says exactly is, do you want to opt into a $10,000 grant, something like that? And and it's literally just as simple as checking the box. Um, and so what they say with that grant is, in theory, if you whether or not you get approved for an actual EIDL loan, technically anyone who applies for it should be given this 10k advance that is forgivable. So that's right. <laughs> we haven't again to Jill's point, we haven't <laughs> seen across all of our networks, not a single person who has yet been given the EIDL num money or loan or grant so so tbd and again as, as she said earlier things are changing on almost a daily basis but certainly um you know we'll try to give updates as soon as we hear anything yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i think one of the questions i've gotten most often is um when you apply for the ppp it says did you get any edil money if you have not had money from an, uh, the Small Business Association from a loan hit your bank account, that number is zero. Just because you applied does not mean you're gonna get it. So until um, EDIL money hits your bank account, your answer on your PPP application is, I get, I've gotten zero money from the EDIL. Um, and the other one, um, the, uh, that $10,000 advance is completely separate from the PPP. So you have to do both applications in order uh, to, to be eligible for both types of funding. Um, so applying for the PPP does not have a component of a $10,000 advance. It's just within the EDIL. Um, so someone just gave us an FYI. They did, they, so they've already applied for EDIL back um, a couple of days ago, like a week ago now. And after calling, uh, got, confirm got a confirmation number and were told that by the SBA that it would be about two to three weeks before they get an email confirming receipt of the application. So um, their SBA is recommending that anybody who applies to EDIL or for EDIL just takes a screenshot with their confirmation number, which okay. I think is smart anyways, if, in case you need to refer <laughs> back to it at a later date. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know, maybe that's three days in congressional time. I'm not, not clear. For the rest of us, three days is three days. But um, yeah, we, we will see what happens with that. Um, but I think that's good advice to just, the, the EDIL is a much longer process. Um, and we'll go through a little bit more on that. Um, so things to keep in mind, you can apply for both programs as long as you don't use the funds for the same purpose. So if you're using PPP to pay your April payroll, you can't nudge a little money in there from EDIL, right? So you just wanna keep your monies from the program separate. And I think Claire had a great suggestion for this on, on one of our other webinars that um, the best practice on this is to create a new bank account and keep the funding for this in that bank account so you can be clear on what you used it for. Um, you can take all, some, or none of these so approved PPP, basically once you're approved, they're gonna put it in your bank account. If you've changed your mind and you don't want it and you don't think you can get it forgiven, you can pay it back to your lender immediately and that'll cancel the loan. Um, so there is no moment where you can say, oh, you know, I don't wanna take it. <clears throat> it just kind of happens if you're approved, they instantly put it in your established bank account with your bank. Um, on the EDIL, oh, for PPP also, you have to apply by, um, if there are still funds left, uh, you can apply up to June 30th um, and have the eight weeks. On the EDIL, this is for the rest of 2020. This is an available program. Um, it's an ongoing program, but these rules in particular with the expanded uh, SBA definition, that's, excuse me, through December 31st. Um, because there's no prepayment penalty with EDIL, um, what I've been recommending to clients is if you think you, you um, have some general economic damages, and this would be a useful program for you for the balance of the year, 
go through the application process. Um, you don't have to activate the loan at the moment that you're approved. So it gives you the option if at any point in the next, you know, three, six, nine months, you decide that I could really benefit from this. You can draw down the loan at a point in the future. You don't have to do it right at the moment that they offer you the, the underwriting opportunity. Um, and you also could take the money and with no prepayment, just give it back or give back the portion you haven't used if you um, and just pay the difference in interest cost if you ultimately don't need the funds. Which it would be a lovely problem to have that none of us need the funds. Um, so other funding sources, um, these two programs have kind of gotten all the glory, the PPP and the EDIL, um, but there are a tremendous number of other funding sources, both grants and loans that you can tap into at the um, state, local and state and local level and privately. Um, and CCI uh, has an amazing list of arts focused resources, grants and microloans that you can apply for. Um, there are state, local, and private loans and grants. The, those of you in the city of LA, there's a, um, the mayor has a 500,000 grant program that started, uh, I believe, this morning. Um, most cities have micro grants, loans, and tax assistance available. Um, if you call, if you happen to be in Los Angeles County, which I think a lot of you are, if you call this business and workers assistance hotline, they will walk you through um, things that you are available from LA city of LA, LA County and regionally um, that you might not be aware of. Um, and everyone that I have sent to this hotline has just had, has really positive feedback. There usually isn't a wait um, and the people are really well educated on, on what your options are, um, whether you're self-employed or small business. Um, so I, I really recommend that resource if you're in LA County. Um, if you were working on a Warner Brothers or Netflix production that got shut down, um, both of those companies have $100 million each set aside to support um, people who were, were staffed on their production um, that have been suspended. So that's a, like an amazing opportunity to kind of self-fund into uh, paying your pay having them pay your paycheck. Um, GoFundMe has a program with Intuit where they're matching donations, matching relief donations, and GoFundMe has waived a lot of their usual charges. Um, so, the, you know, those are just a few, but once you start to dig into it, I know some states are bridging PPP and, you know, for, um, putting short-term uh, grants in place to help businesses stay afloat. Um, so I really encourage you beyond these two big programs to explore other options that are available. Um, and since you've gotten organized for a more complicated application process, these should be pretty straightforward, just a matter of doing the work. Um, a couple of resources in terms of getting more information. Uh, again, in LA County, this Business and Workers Assistance Hotline is a really great resource. Um, I would say, like, especially as we talk about unemployment next, if you have any questions about unemployment, they are a much better place to call than the state. Um, Another that we don't use very often, um, there's something called the Small Business Development Corporation. It's affili affiliated with the SBA, but it's staffed by professional volunteers, people like me and Claire, um, who are trained by the SBA to understand all of these programs and to assist you in finding and securing funds. Um, so I'll, I'll put more information up on that a little later in the presentation. Okay, so that's the first and probably the most complicated. Uh, is the small business relief programs that are available to you. Um, let me check in on Q&A before I go on. Is there anything we should clarify on that? No, that's pretty okay. straightforward. Okay. All right, so protection number two uh, is enhanced unemployment. Um, so with the CARES expansion, um, the self-employed for the first time are eligible to collect unemployment for the rest of the year. Um, some states have already implemented this, some have not, um, but the CARES Act technically allows sole proprietors, independent contractors, freelancers, owners of single member LLCs and S Corps, right, those people we talked about before, um, and people who work for not-for-profits, uh, all to apply for unemployment. Um, and if you've been furloughed, furloughed from a job, but you're still receiving your health insurance, you can collect unemployment, whether your furlough is partial or complete. Um, 
salaried employees um, who make under $100,000 a year who have had their salaries reduced, they can collect unemployment for the difference. Uh, and hourly workers, um, you don't have to be entirely laid off if you've had a partial reduction, either in hours or in what you're paid. You can use unemployment to make up the difference. Um, so some of these expanded benefits, um, depending on how many weeks your state offered to start with, you may be eligible for up to 36 weeks. So it's plus 12 weeks on wherever your state started. Um, and that is for the rest of the year. So whether you start unemployment now or at a point in the future, um, there are, you have 36 weeks of benefit if you're claiming for the first time within this year um, and your state supports the full uh, 36 weeks. Um, if you've applied for unemployment before, you know that you have to wait a week. Um, there, in most states, there's a waiver of your first week of non-payment, um, so you can start collecting right away. Um, one of the biggest things from the CARES Act is they've added $600 per week in payment to encourage you to observe stay at home and not go out job searching. So you will get significantly more from unemployment than you would have at a point in the past where it's 40 to 60% of your take home typically. Um, if you are self-employed um, and you are thinking like, oh, I haven't paid W-2, um, on your taxes every year, you're paying self-employment tax. They normally just don't allow you to collect unemployment against that. So as long as you've paid self-employment tax on your taxes, right, for, um, for paying yourself or having you know, some type of, type of 1099 or self-generated income, that's what qualifies you for unemployment right now. Um, and state by state, um, Gusto is a small business specialist payroll company, um, and they have a really great unemployment insurance benefit um, up, that they're updating state by state on a regular basis. So if you're curious about for the state that you're in exactly um, what you're eligible for, what number of weeks, whether they've waived the first week, this is a really great resource for you to look at um, and see what's going on in your state. In some states, uh, the self-employed are being sent to a different landing page because their system uh, is not, you know, uh, they can't modify it in order to make the questions work for, for um, the self-employed. Um, I know in California, technically, uh, you are allowed to apply but the program isn't in place yet for self-employed people. So again, uh, I encourage you to um, call that hotline or check in and, and make sure that you understand how to apply for unemployment in California. Um, and remember, this is new. A lot of states are still getting this set up. We're only 10 days into this eligibility. Um, so if you don't get the answer you want, don't assume that it's not going to happen. Keep checking back, keep trying, keep checking your resources. Um, because technically, again, technically you are allowed to do this. It's just taking different states a different amount of time and the government in getting the funds to them in terms of turning on the tap for self-employed people. Okay, any questions on unemployment before we go forward? Well, Claire, anything you wanna add? Uh, someone did ask um, if someone is self-employed and lost some work, but not all work, can they still apply for unemployment? Um, as long as your compensation in total is under $100,000 per year, um, then yes, you should be able to. And somebody in the chat um, asks, how do we claim the $600 increase in unemployment? Is there an additional process apart from regular claim forms? Uh, good question. There isn't a separate process. This is just an increase in the total amount that's paid out. So this was allocated by Congress across the board, the plus $600. Um, I will uh, just make a clarification on this. Um, one question that we've gotten in previous webinars is, can I get the PPP, right, get my payroll funded and also claim unemployment? Um, so if you are eligible now to apply for unemployment and it's going to be a couple of weeks before you can pay yourself or pay your payroll and you have no money coming in right now, um, I would encourage you to apply for unemployment because once you go through the process of getting set up with um, your state's EDD or your, your um, unemployment uh, administrator, um, then week to week, they're going to ask you to call in and say, I'm claiming or I'm not claiming. 
um, in the weeks where you're able to pay yourself, whether through PPP or something else, you're not going to make a claim. But when you run out of PPP, or if it takes a few weeks for your money to come in, you could be getting unemployment in the meantime. So it doesn't hurt to work on getting set up until if you don't have any money coming in right now, if your income has gone to zero, if no one's paying you, um, you can go through this process now and get set up um, and then just be in a position where you can collect or not collect based on how much you make in a given week and whether you can pay yourself. Okay. Um, so the last protection is managing your cash flow. Um, and this has kind of been downplayed in terms of uh, like other programs and getting money in the bank. There are some things that you don't have to pay right now um, that could be you know, really substantial for you um, as a self-employed person um, that will let you keep more money in the bank. Um, the first thing is federal tax relief. Um, so this is the IRS, not your state tax board. You still have to check with them independently. But for anything that you owe the IRS, um, up to a million dollars of business or personal taxes that you owe for 2019, um, you can defer those payments until April of 2021. Um, talk to your accountant about it. Make sure it's documented. You have to tell the IRS that you know you owe them money and you're choosing to defer. You can't just not pay it because then you'll get penalized. Um, but as long as you filed the documentation that says, I know I owe this and I'm deferring, then you're fine uh, to put that off for one year. Um, and that can make a major difference in operating budget that you'll have in the meantime. Um, also your federal quarterly payments. Um, we've all gotten you know, personal and business extension to July 15th. Um, with that, you do not have to pay your quarterly uh, federal tax payment on April 15th. So if you had a really great Q1 and you expected to have to pay in a lot of taxes near the tax reserve, um, any losses that you have until uh, the end of Q2 are going to be balanced out against that. You're going to have a much smaller tax bill or possibly no tax bill by the end of June. Um, so if you, um, the conservative way to do this is if you knew what your tax reserve was and you have a projection on what you think you'll take in in July and you average it out over those six months. Um, you can take out of your tax reserve and put into back into working capital the difference of uh, what you expect or a conservative difference of what you expect to not have to pay in taxes. Um, but quarterly, a quarterly payment here is a, uh, always a really good option. Um, and the last is uh, if you are planning to contribute to a 401k or a SEP, um, the deadline has been extended to July 15th. So if you, you know, had said, hey, we're going to put this money in, and now you're not sure if it's a good idea to do it, um, you can wait and do it uh, by July 15th or you know, when you made that tax deadline in July 15th and hold on to that money in the meantime. So again, check your state requirements because you may still have to pay state taxes, but this is for federal. Um, and I think this is uh, in terms of uh, tax money that's staying in your bank account. This is one of the biggest pockets of money um, that uh, people you know, expected that they'd have to pay out that could be available and you don't have to wait on this. It's already in your account. Um, in terms of state and local tax relief, um, there are states that are allowing you to use your sales taxes that you collected in Q1. And they're basically creating a grace period of uh, taxes, waived, taxes collected in Q1 um, your obligation to pay is waived and they're just making it an instant available fund source for you. Um, this can include bottle taxes, um, reserves that you have for um, luxury taxes, things like that. But um, it's state by state and in some cases in larger cities, if the city specifically is waiving it. Um, so I really encourage you this uh, link at the bottom, there is a company called Avalara that is excellent for online tax calculations. Their editorial team has been doing a really great job every day of keeping up uh, the coronavirus um, allowances at the state and city level. So look through their local tax relief options um, and see what might apply to you if you if you have collected state sales tax or another type of tax. Um, and local tax relief, some cities, uh, if you call the business office, can waive your local taxes on the spot. Um, in LA, they can do this. They can waive your business taxes. Um, and actually give you some direct relief um, like on the spot by calling them. 
Um, so, you know, check if there's any other local tax relief available to you that can be activated um, that immediately saves you some money. Um, for staffing, um, a term that you're probably hearing in the last couple of weeks we haven't heard in a long time is a furlough. Um, so furloughs versus layoffs, if you do need to downsize your staff, you have the option to partially or totally furlough people, which is not severing your employment relationship, but just saying, I don't need you right now, or I don't need you as much right now. But they get to keep their health insurance, and at the moment that you need them to come back, you can restore them without having to rehire uh, or going through any paperwork with the state. Um, so if you can afford to pay your 50% of health insurance, um, it lets people keep their health insurance, but you can take uh, what you're paying them you know, to reduction or down to zero for a period of time. Um, those who are impacted by furloughs are eligible for enhanced unemployment. Um, but again, they get to keep their health insurance, but they can still collect unemployment against their, their, their wages. Um, and if you are uh, paying them under, you know, trying to go for PPP forgiveness, um, if you hire back at a 90% level by June 30th, you'll still be eligible for forgiveness. So there is, it's not an all or nothing in terms of um, if you have layoffs, it automatically counts against you. There are a couple of ways of if you need to temporary for low people or reduce their hours, um, you can still get your PPP forgiven if you hire them back within the period of the loan. Um, salary reductions, uh, again, one we don't use very often, but for at-will employees, you can reduce salary across the board. Um, and if you are reducing salaries for those paid over $100,000 a year, uh, it doesn't impact your PPP forgiveness. So um, that's something to consider. Um, you can suspend your 401k match. Um, and this is, again, a place where I think the SBDC is really good at helping you go through your options of what's best for you and what's best for the people who work for you um, and just figuring out what combination uh, of, of any of these things might be best for you. Okay, my big caveat on the next slide. Um, everything that is listed here, you have to have verified with your lender or the person who gave you the stuff, or you can't just not pay your bills. But as long as you go through the proper process, um, these are all things that you may not have to pay for between one and six months without penalty. Okay, so what do you not have to pay this month? Um, your rent, so California has a 90 day stay on residential evictions, that's only for your house, for your rent. Um, for your commercial loan, um, if you have a a term in there that says if the government restricts access to your office, right, you've been declared non-essential, um, you may be able to negotiate that you don't have to pay your rent because of that term. Um, many landlords are negotiating on rent or will add the payments to the end of, your, of, of, your peer, of the period. Um, so you may be able to work around having to pay both your commercial rent and your personal rent, uh, depending on where you are. Um, mortgage and car loans. Um, most banks have activated um, their, what were their forbearance programs for a 60 or 90 day deferral. Um, what you wanna watch with this, uh, it's being rolled out really unevenly. Um, if you call your bank and they're like, yes, you can defer, but it's a balloon payment in 90 days, uh, that actually isn't the way it works right now, but some banks are going to their old forbearance rules because they haven't caught up with CARES Act yet. So if they, you call and that's what they say, that's not correct. Um, I know this sounds weird, but what we're hearing is just call your bank back so you get the answer you want. Um, so don't accept a balloon payment on this. What should be happening with your mortgage or with your car loan is that they simply add the two or three months that you don't pay onto the end of the loan period at your regular rate. Um, that's what's allowed right now. So again, uh, just you know, look out for any kind of forbearance language around balloon payments that would kick you into um, a, a mortgage revision. Um, credit cards, call your lender. Um, most can waive one month late payment fee and, and they can adjust your interest rate on the spot. Um, the interest rate adjustment is always true for credit cards, uh, just particularly useful right now. 
Um, and if you have a gold or platinum Amex, uh, they are allowing you through their chat feature to use their hardship program. You can skip two payment deadlines, have your interest waived, um, and when you eventually pay the bill, they'll reinstate your points. Um, but I do know this doesn't work if you have a blue Amex, like they're still gonna be not, not kind of nasty to you about pay, paying your bill. But on gold and platinum Amex, they're, uh, again, this is, you can use this in the chat function, just type in the hardship program. Uh, and they may instantly make a list of the things that um, they push you into for program. Uh, federal student loans, the Department of Education issued a six month interest rate holiday that started, uh, I believe in mid-March. Um, so you can su suspend your payments without penalty until October. In this time, your federal student loans are not accruing any interest. If you're able to pay them, it's a great time to pay them because you'll pay them down really fast. 100% will go to principal. Um, but most loan servicers have set up a really simple deferral page um, where you can log into your account and there's a button that you can click saying, I want to defer. Um, and they'll put your uh, repayment on pause for six months. Uh, and again, there's no penalty to this and you're not paying interest in the meantime. Um, and the last thing is your merchant fees. Um, it's a really good time to ask your processor to negotiate. Um, typically, you know, they don't negotiate unless you're let eight, nine thousand dollars a month uh, on that 2.9 percent fee. Um, but given that there's a lot of competition for good business right now, um, they, we've seen more flexibility in terms of negotiating on merchant fees. Okay, other resources. Um, we mentioned the CCI re resource list. Um, so here's the full URL for it if you want to screen link screenshot this page. Um, Allison also gave us a freelance resource list that's list, uh, linked here. So when you get, the, um, when you get the, the presentation, you'll be able to click through on that. Um, I mentioned the Small Business Development Corporation. Uh, this is the URL, URL for that, americasfbdc.org. Um, this is a free federally sponsored program with 600 locations. Um, so I know here in LA, we have five locations of SBDC. Um, these are staffed by professionals and business owners from your community to provide you with um, free business consulting and support. So when you call the SBDC, they'll ask you what type of business you are, what size, where you're located, how you're incorporated, and they'll assign you two people within 24 hours who have knowledge of your industry and the kind of business you are from your community to help you take advantage of some of these resources and think through what you might want to do, what your options are for your business right now. Um, another really great resource, um, Silicon Valley Bank is typically only available to venture-backed companies, but they worked with Hello Alice to put together this COVID19businesscenter.com. Um, and this is really an amazing website. Um, they have everything on here from how to work with your lender, you know, to get deferrals in place and what those should be, and if you can do them online, to local grants, private grants, um, programs that have come online. Um, so this just depending on what you're looking for, um, they have an incredible wealth of resources on this page. Um, and the last I'll mention, um, Inc. Magazine, when all this legislation came out, did a bunch of interviews um, and they have a lot of videos on the SBA loan programs, on the PPP, the EDIL, other relief programs, other changes um, that were in the CARES Act. So if you prefer to watch or listen to something um, versus reading all this information, um, they have a lot of videos where they explain how this works um, and kind of talk about uh, how the programs are administered. Okay, um, so I know that's a lot of information that we've thrown at you all. Um, I wanna open up the floor for more Q&A, any questions that you have or, or clarification. Um, yeah. I'm gonna go back to video. So one of the questions, I've got a handful um, to run through, but uh, in terms of allowable expenses for PPP, what about insurance on like maybe rental insurance, like on a, on a studio space? And potentially what about property taxes if it is mm -hmm. a business space? What would that, would that constitute as an allowable expense as some of the PPP write-offs and expenses? Okay, um, so property tax and insurance, let me bring it over to me. Um, 
property tax and insurance are not listed as forgivable, but um, in the PPP, it does say that 75% of your total allowance has to go toward allowed expenses. So payroll, benefits, um, utilities, and rent. If you want to use the other 25% to cover obligations like 1099 contractors or your payroll or your insurance, you can still have the loan forgiven, right? So over those eight weeks, 75% has to go for what it was intended for, but you can use 25% of it for these other areas that you need to pay. Um, and the loan will still be forgiven. And then the next question for PPP regarding side hustlers, can they use their art grant and crowdfunding income from the last two years schedule C's to demonstrate lost revenue that's anticipated for 2020? Um, let me make sure I understand the question. Okay, so you have a schedule C which Schedule C from 2019 is what you need, one of the documents that you can use to prove your PPP eligibility for self-employment income. Um, if you are trying to show lost income, that would be through EDIL, right? That's economic damages. Um, what you do with PPP is it's showing what you have paid yourself, whether directly because it's income net of expenses that you earned through your self-employment activity, or through 1099s as a freelancer. Um, so that's the proof that you're looking for in PPP, that you had either payment, payroll payment, or something that was income from self-employment activities. That's what they're using to calculate. Um, if you have foregone income or income that you lost, um, that's something that when you uh, apply for the EDIL, for the um, economic disaster injury loan, those are the injuries that you're going to cite on that loan document for why you should get um, why you should get the loan. Let me know if that made sense. I can I can try to clarify on that if you have more questions. And so, if folks receive the ten thousand dollar SBA grant from EDIL look, application, will they need to pay taxes on it for 2020 taxes? Excellent question. Um, the EDIL advance is not taxable, right? So it is, uh, I know grants are normally taxable as income. It is not taxable. Uh, the PPP also, as far as we know, is not taxable to you as income. The goal with it is that you're passing through um, income to your employees and to yourself that you'll pay income taxes on in your regular return. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's meant to be a pass through for small businesses. Um, so neither the advance on EDIL or the PPP is currently taxable. And then someone asks, if your income is from the sale of artwork and you qualify for UI, what happens if a gallery sells a piece here and there online? Does it disqualify you or just reduce what you get for one week of UI? If you sell a piece, Read that last part to me again. If you, if your income is usually from the sale of artwork and in this situation you qualify for UI, what happens if a gallery sells a single piece here, maybe another piece next week online? Do these sales disqualify you from UI or does it reduce okay. what you get for one week? Um, it depends on the value of the commission that you receive. Um, Typically in weeks that you're receiving commission, if it starts to be over about $1,000 for the week, it is going to, um, it's not worth claiming that week because you're really not going to get any money. Um, but in the weeks that you don't have any income from commissions, and that income from commissions is when you get the money, right? Not when they sold it. So when the money hits your bank account from that commission, that is a week that you got Monday, you got money counted Sunday to Saturday. Um, so make sure, again, that you're not anticipating because there was a sale made that you're not eligible. You're only not eligible for unemployment insurance in the weeks that you have income, right? So it's the weeks that the money hits your bank account. If you currently owe back taxes, do you qualify for the $1,200 stimulus for PPP and or for EDIL? Hmm. I don't know about your 
stimulus funding. Um, and it, it is a good question on all of this. Like if you qualify for that $1,200 stimulus, that's personal stimulus. So this is everything else we've talked about is for your business. So you can get that $1,200 and it affects nothing about your eligibility for these other programs because it's based on your business income. Um, in terms of if they are giving you the 1200 against back taxes, I don't know, but we can look that up. Um, Claire, do you happen to know that? I don't, that not offhand. Yeah. Okay. That's the first so we'll time see. I've actually gotten that question. Yeah, so we'll look into um, if you can do that. Um, if the, the PPP and the EDIL, it's not a question that's on the questionnaire. Like the questions are like, have you committed certain crimes within the last five years? Um, have, you, have you had a bankruptcy within a certain period if you're a majority owner of the company or, or more than a 20% owner? Uh, it doesn't ask anything about your tax status. So as long as that tax status hasn't affected your credit score, I think to a certain level, it shouldn't affect the business's eligibility for these funds. Um, that's, I mean, as far as I understand it, Claire, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one is a bit unknown to me. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So can you, oh, okay, well, so can you ask for only what you need from the PPP or do you have to take the two and a half amount calculated with a bank? And the answer is they'll, so they'll, based on the calculations that you've given them, and usually the calculation will be that two and a half times your payroll. Let's say they give you just a flat amount. I'm gonna just use the example of $20,000. If you look at that $20,000 and you realize, listen, I can't spend this within the first eight months, it is possible to not accept that loan. And I think, Jill, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can ask for something lower or negotiate for something lower. Is that, is that accurate? Um, so the, calcula the calculation that you go through when you apply is your maximum allowed loan. You do not have to apply for your maximum allowed loan. Um, if you think that is just too much money and you couldn't spend 75% of it on allowed expenses. So, you know, again, in Claire's example, if you had $20,000 and you only thought you would spend $10,000 over eight weeks on payroll benefits, I, I mean, I've never seen a case where because of the way this is calculated, you end up with a bunch of extra money. It's, if, if, you, if you still have your staff and you're going to qualify for the forgivable percentage, really the maximum loan allowed al aligns pretty well with what you would expect to pay. I mean, almost everyone that I've gone through with this, gets, they go through the process and they're like, that's all I get. Not, oh my gosh, this is so much money. <laughs> so um, I would go through and look at your maximum loan amount. But if the maximum loan amount, it, you don't think you can spend 75% of that in eight weeks on your payroll benefits, rent, and utilities, then you can ask to take less than the maximum amount allowed. That's just your cap. Yeah. That's actually our last question in Q&A. If anyone else has any additional questions, now is the time to ask. Are there any questions that you guys have been hearing from your clients over and over? actually a lot of the same questions that <laughs> we've gotten today um, that I've already, some of which I've answered directly um, in, in chat, but, but I think there's definitely just some lack of um, clarity around whether or not folks can apply for all three being unemployment, PPP and EDIL, which you absolutely can. And, I think maybe in certain some circumstances it is possible to get all three. Um, so that's been one. Folks can't. <laughs> I've I've gotten that I've gotten the feedback that folks find it hard to believe that the ten thousand SBA grant is forgivable and that it's just regardless of whether or not there is some sort of um, there is approval for EDIL. So that's. Uh, that's been something. So someone just commented and said, I thought you cannot do UI and PPP. 
Okay. You can't do UI and PPP at the same time. So you can apply for the PPP, and if you get it, which is not guaranteed, okay, but if you get it and you've already applied for unemployment, in the weeks that you resume paying your salary using the PPP, you will not collect unemployment. So that's what you can't do. You can't double dip and say, I'm taking the 600 bucks and I'm paying myself, right? You can't do both. Um, so if you are going to meet the forgivable um, qualifications of the PPP loan, you will be paying yourself your regular salary for the weeks that you worked for eight weeks. Um, if you decide to reduce that a little bit because of you meet the 75% threshold, um, you still can't use that to apply against UI because that's, you know, again, your choice. You were funded with the intent of paying your full salary or your full dividend that you have paid yourself. Um, so I think that's where things get sticky of if you try to do both. Um, so I think a lot of the time what happens is people communicate a bright line on this because they don't want you to like kind of get confused or make a mistake where you could end up getting penalized. But as long as you understand when and in which weeks you don't have income, you haven't paid yourself, it is not part of, I know you're paying yourself every two weeks. If it's a, you know, a week within that two week pay period, you're getting paid, even though maybe that one week you didn't get money. And I think those are the points that like are kind of confusing about it, especially when you're salaried of like, is this a week I got pay or isn't this a week I got pay? Um, if it's within your payroll period and you're going to be paid for those 14 days or 10 days within your payroll period, you're not eligible for unemployment because you're collecting your salary. Um, unless, of course, uh, you've been furloughed or laid off and you're getting a partial. But if you're paying yourself and you're using PPP proceeds, that would be you planning to pay your full salary or at least 90% of your salary. Um, so you wouldn't qualify for unemployment. So then as, as a follow-up to this, is it possible then to extend UI if they stagger PPP payments or kind of try to just parse it all out for one week versus not the other week? Yeah, yes, it is possible to stagger. So you have an eligibility period, again, depending on your state, that may be as high as 36 weeks. Um, so the question is like, do you if you don't take those 36 weeks sequentially, right? Like I, if I took unemployment this week, I take unemployment next week, I take it the following week, right? Once it's, it's about you opening the, the window over a 52 week period. So you can pace it out over 52 weeks, but if you don't use that amount of time in 52 weeks, then your eligibility barring another act of Congress would go away. Um, but you can pace out when you take your, your UI benefits, you know, basically from now until at least the end of December, um, if not longer, um, and not have to take it every week. And, you know, I, I would say for like, for those of you who are on commission, I know I talked to some realtors about this, like they have times that they get a huge commission, but they get it for one week, right? And then they're not getting anything else and possibly for weeks and weeks and weeks. So that's a really good example of if you're if you're getting commission income, right, and it's a one shot and it's not guaranteed in the future, you got income for that week, but you don't get income in the other week. So I think this is one in particular that um, having the unemployment system available to you can help fill that in for a lot of weeks, even though you have weeks where you're getting commission or in, uh, you have you know one performance or something like that where you get money for one week. Um, you can kind of balance both in order to keep your cash flow going. Um, someone asks, most of our public art commissions are on hold. We are concerned cities may slash funds for some upcoming commissions, so they need to invoice now. If they submit a large invoice and get paid in a single payment, will this disqualify them for unemployment payments beyond the week they receive the money? Most of the money will go to fabricators who aren't working at the moment, so they won't be paying them until they start up again, and their net will be lower than the money received, but it will look like they would have received a lot of money. Is that uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm just switching it over to me. Um, <laughs> uh, I was trying to listen and do computer stuff at the same time. Um, 
That is a good question. So if you're getting a commission, unless there's a period attached to it where there's like, we are giving you this commission for a period of work, like that would be in that period, you would be expected to pay out over that period. Um, but if you're getting it on a single day, right, within a week, um, it more depends on like how much of it are you going to put toward your self-employment income? Are you able to pay yourself over a few weeks of time or are you not? Because most of that is going out to your fabricators because you have it in reserve against a project, right? So if you've gotten that commission and you're, you're having to hold it in a project reserve and pay it out to fabricators and then you get paid last, um, if you're on any kind of payroll system, you're not paying yourself. Um, I would say this is probably a good one to talk through with your accountant and see if there's a way to create a project reserve against it, even if you're on a cash basis. Sorry if that's Greek for most of you, but um, like if, if you talk through it with your accountant, there are sometimes ways that you can put this on your balance sheet and not your income statement. So that you create a project reserve and the project reserve gets used up and then you record you getting paid at the end of what's left. Um, so that's one way that you might be able to get around it looking like you've had a massive amount of income. That is actually money that you have to pay out over time. Um, but I would say like that one, it, it, a lot of it depends on the terms of the grant administration or the commission administration. So I would go through that one more specifically with your accountant who understands the, the commission structure. This seems to be a pretty common question I've answered a couple times already, so we'll go live with it. But um, so someone does not take payments on a regular basis as payroll to themselves as income from the revenue is generated generally by selling art. So how do they prove self-employment is a paycheck slash payroll? So basically in that case, you would take um, all the revenue earned from your sales from a certain period of time. Um, if you were a w W-2 employee at any given point, you would also use those documents, assuming that they fall within that allotted time frame. And if, as well, you were a 1099 contractor, freelancer for any jobs within that time frame, you would also use that against the overall calculation to figure out what your payroll is. Um, so then someone asks, if Wells Fargo is their bank, do they have to search for another lender to apply for PPP? <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I've been going through this with a couple of clients just today. Um, if you're applying for PPP over $200,000, it's going to be a lot easier for you. If you're a small business and you have a smaller amount of PPP, a lot of the banks don't want to take on new clients that are at that size. So... Um, what we've been doing, uh, if you happen to use Gusto as your payroll provider, um, they have set up with an SBA lender a direct relationship where you don't have to have um, an existing banking relationship. And you go into your Gusto portal and it says, let us help you apply for PPP. And they port over all of your payroll information into the form with this new, with, I think it's called Cross River Bank which is an accredited, you probably have never heard of it, but it's an accredited SBA bank in Utah. Um, and they are, um, they help you port all of your information over and Cross River for Gusto customers will underwrite non-existing PPP loans. Um, QuickBooks on and Intuit on Sunday, they are supposed to be doing full process, like acting as a lender. Um, helping you through your QuickBooks instance, your QuickBooks payroll in particular, if you have QuickBooks payroll activated, they're supposed to be launching a very similar program where they've partnered with someone and will help you get underwritten directly through your QuickBooks account. Um, other than that, we're really waiting to see there is a new batch of lenders um, that are waiting to be approved to administer this program. Um, and depending on like what they have for availability, you may be able to work with them. But it has been um, this week a very frustrating process for those with Wells Fargo. We just have to keep pinging banks and telling them the size of the loan you're looking for and trying to find someone who will administer it. Like Claire, I don't know if you have any go-tos on this. My two go-tos stopped taking non-client bank accounts the other day. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. no. Um... 
I don't. I mean, I only really work with like the biggest banks through all of my clients so far. Um, so that's that's sort of what I've, I can only say what I've been in the trenches on. Um, but we did have a question. Someone is asking whether or not it's recommended to use loan brokers like Fundera, especially as it pertains to applying for PPP. Or is it a bad idea too? Um, let's see. I have seen some things with loan brokers where they'll go out and try to find you somebody. As long as you're not paying for the brokerage, that's okay. Like it shouldn't cost you anything to apply for these loans. Um, so if they're saying like, we'll take a percentage or something like that, like that's not okay. But if they're going to charge the bank that takes on the loan, a percentage on the back end. Um, and I have a seen, I have been approached by a couple companies that are doing this. Um, that to me is okay. If they're going to broker it out for you, it's just like, you know, refinancing your mortgage and having them go out to all the banks and saying, who wants this mortgage? Right. So, um, I think Fundera in general is a reputable company and a reputable source. I think if it's something that you know and you feel comfortable with, and again, you don't have to pay anything, that that's a, that's a, a perfectly good solution if that's the right way to go for you. Just given the Wells Fargo situation, you have to solve it somehow. Someone actually just... I, I, oh, sorry. Yep. I, dro I dropped into the chat some names that one of our other trainers, who's also a, a financial planner, um, consultant um, gave to me yesterday. I haven't verified them myself, but um, I dropped them in the chat. If you guys want to, you know, Google them or contact them to find out. Okay. Thank uh, you, some... Allison. I'm just looking at these right now. Yeah, U.S. Bank. Yeah, I mean, U.S. Bank is very big, but um, like off the coast. So I wouldn't be surprised. Credit Union. Yeah, it's worth a try. Yeah, and uh, someone just commented and said, FYI, Fundera says their fee comes from the funder. Mm -hmm. Which is um, what it is supposed to be. Yeah. Um, and then someone is asking, for UI, they had filed only 1099s in California. Um, so on 326 after freelancers eligibility. They did not get a letter with their award yet, but got in a mail a continued claim. And how are they determining the award? Because in their application, there was no place to share income. And as a freelancer, it was all over the place, though they did a calculation uh, using a worksheet saying that they were eligible for the max amount. They're still just not sure how their UI total will be determined. And also they didn't get a letter with their account numbers, so they can't open an account online yet to even see what they have now. So they're just not sure where to find this info. Okay. Um, if you happen to be in LA County, call the Business and Workers Hotline. Um, that they will be able to get to the bottom of this for you. Odds are that um, for Free, I, I know in California for a freelance and an independent contractor, um, they have had, they are not ready, even though they've said you can go through the normal application process, they are not technically admitting people in until they get the federal money. And I don't know if that means that they will backdate you and give you the three weeks once they get the money, or you start from the day that they're funded federally and they're able to fund this program. Um, I would think what's fair is when you applied and the state told us from the middle of March that this program was available. So that seems fair that they would backdate it once they get funded and, 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 and uh, give you that, that amount of funds. Um, but if you do, I, I, I think the, the only good answers I've heard from this are people calling like that business and workers hotline and working through it with them. Um, because they understand how California unemployment works. Um, and I don't know if they're asking you when you call if you're in LA County or not. <laughs> I just know they just know the answers for generally programs in California and in particular eligibility within LA County for different programs. So it could be worth giving them a call um, since it's a good resource if you're in California in general and just seeing if they'll help you out. Um, if you know it's the general California question about, um, about UI. But beyond that, um, if you're outside of California, I would check that um, 
gusto on employment worksheet and see where they're at in, in your state in terms of adding freelancers. Um, if there's a separate URL, like I said, someone set up a landing page um, where freelancers and independent contractors have to apply for unemployment because it is a different set of questions. Um, so, you know, again, just check out, um, check that out from, for where your state is at. Um, and try to like look for any regional resources, like any helplines or things that have been set up by your county or your city and try those rather than calling uh, your general state number. Okay. Um, so someone is asking in doing their UI certification for benefits today, they didn't know where to indicate where they didn't know where to indicate they're under 200 commission dollars for an artwork received. It says, did you work this week and gives you a choice to check for commissions, but was not physically at their studio that week. It's just something that sold online and the commission came in. So do they still check the box that says they were at work that week, even if they were not physically there? Hmm. Well, let's see, the commission online is the commission, right? So if you have art offered wherever it is, like that's still a commission that you have to declare. So that part, um, in terms of if you are online only and not physically in your office, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if that's your obligation, but I mean, if you weren't, if you're non-essential and you weren't able to go to your office and you weren't working this week, this is just the commission you would receive. My instinct on that is that, that no, you were not at your office this week, right? You were not physically at work, but you can receive commissions in weeks you're not physically at work. Um, so that would be my answer for that. Um, again, with unemployment insurance, um, the best resources is someone that you can talk to in your state who knows the particular rules and the form of that. Um, if it's, and I, I, we didn't ask what state that was in, if it's California specific or not. I don't know. Do you happen to know? Um, it's California specific, but not LA. I think okay. Alameda County. Okay. Um, I know that the Bay Area also has a similar hotline to what we have here in LA. I would say call that. Um, just look up your Alameda County or even um, like Bay Area Regional. Um, the SBDC can also help you with this. Um, so try those resources if you're looking for someone who like understands locally what your requirements are. Um, and just as a follow up to the money or to the commission sold online, it was a direct deposit for something another company sold. Okay. Direct deposit for something another company sold. Uh, it's still self-employment income that landed in your bank account this week, though. I mean, is that how you would look at it, Claire, from a bookkeeping? That's account? how I would look yeah. at it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we have a couple minutes left. How many? How many questions do we have? We only have one, but it's okay. kind of mixed in with. So to the question, I'm going to have to just go back to this person's question. So just give me a second. Um, yeah, I just want to point out too that um, in some cases, some folks are, have joined us late because um, they had the wrong link and I sent them the link after the, the workshop had started. So rest assured, if you're joining late, you will be able to watch the recording and get the slides later so you can see what you missed. So for instance, um, Jill was referring to the hotline. Um, there, it's, act, it's in the slides, so you'll get that um, at some point. Yeah maybe other things people missed. Yeah, yeah no, I think um, I'm just, yeah, to Allison's point, and I'm also answering this last question is mm -hmm. type in, but okay. anything, anything that we've referenced will be within the slides. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, so if there's anything, just definitely be sure to check all of those links in there and, and you know, if it's the state by state breakouts for who exactly you need to go to to help, um, those will be within the Gusta resources. But I, I encourage you all to just really go through the slides and the links available and you'll find 
everything that we've referenced here and maybe them some. Yeah, thank you so much. Our number one tip from this is if you don't want, get the answer you want, don't accept it, try again, right? Because the answers are changing every single day per bank, per lender, per state that you call, per human you get on the phone. But there's yeah. been so much information over the last 10 days. Uh, it's all rolling out at different pace Again, depending on the customer service person you might get, they might be current, they might not. So if it is not the answer you expected or not the answer you want, try again. Try again until it's the answer you think is what you were supposed to get. Great. Okay, so it's 3.30. Thank you guys so much. You guys have so much information. I know some folks came in and out and a lot of folks will probably be watching this recording. So um, thank you, uh, Jill and Claire, so much for, for answering so many questions in such short time. Um, so like I mentioned to folks at the very beginning, I'm going to email everyone with a link to uh, everyone who was here live or everyone who registered rather. Um, I'm going to send you an email with a link to um, fill out an evaluation survey for us. We really appreciate you taking just a couple of minutes to do that, and we'll share that with the trainers and um, all of our staff here at CCI. Also, check out cciarts.org for our other upcoming workshops, and uh, as well as our um, link to emergency resources that includes grants, that includes, in some cases, like some of the, these types of information about CARES and um, unemployment, things like that all kinds of information in there that I'm updating every time I'm at my desk. Um, and um, so thank you all so much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. This was great. Okay. Good luck out there, stay healthy. <laughs> yeah. Stay safe. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Thank, thank you, guys. Allison.